So, uh, let's go through the stuff you should know already. All right, well, we are dealing with compilers. What is a compiler? Do you know what a compiler is? You know what a compiler is? Uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> what is a compiler? Don't read that. You're going to read this. You're going to read it off the board, aren't you? <laughs> okay, a compiler thing is... Um... Is a program that uh, translates from a high-level language, mm -hmm. from a language that people can have understand, trained people have, can have understand, to a binary code. Well, so that's 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 almost right. That's what, that's how typical compilers are. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, a compiler is just something that translates from one language, uh, one source computer language, to another language. And in fact, when you were saying high-level languages, it turns out that there are compilers which don't operate on high-level languages. They operate on low-level languages. A good example of this is uh, Java just-in-time compilers, mm -hmm. which take Java bytecode, which definitely isn't a high-level language, mm -hmm. and they convert it down to a machine code. Right, and and actually. Even going down to machine code is not required because uh, we have some compilers which go from the source language back to the source language again. We'll come to this in a second, like C to C compilers and things like this. Okay, so C to C compiler. A C to C compiler, yes. Okay. Those are called source to source compilers, and I've, I've got we'll, next slide. We'll we'll do that in the okay. next slide. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So, uh, but the, but you are right in that often most of the time the compilers go from a high level language down to assembly code or something like that. Okay. At least all the compilers you care about. All the compilers you care about, yes. Yes, okay. So some example compilers, you'll see things like LLVM and GCC, which take languages like C and convert it down to assembly code. Uh, you'll see languages that take other languages and convert them down to C. We might be thinking, why on earth would I do that? The reason for that, Pavlos, uh, I know you were thinking that, is that um, as you are developing a new language, uh, rather than having to build an entire backend, the one that knows how to compile to different machines, if you can work out how to convert your code into C, then you can pass it on to a final compiler to do all the extra work for you. Okay, so this is actually how C++ started, for example, where uh, Bjorn Struestrup, uh, I hope I pronounced his name correctly. Nobody does. Nobody, nobody pronounces it. Not even he pronounces it correctly. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think he's well known as the C++ guy. The C++, like that guy. <laughs> so uh, he built a program called C Front, which takes uh, what he called C with classes at the time uh, and converted it down to C. And that was how the first C++ compiler came about. Uh, we've already talked about uh, some Java stuff. So your Java CC takes Java source code and converts it down to Java bytecode. And then that can either be interpreted by a virtual machine or most virtual machines these days compile that bytecode on the fly down to machine code for you. And then finally we have these uh, C to C compilers and their ilk, uh, which do source to source compilation. Okay? Mm -hmm. You're all good? Yeah. Get it? It's easy, right? Okay. So, um, there are, whilst, whilst it's true that these things often target assembly, there are also these source to source compilers, C to C. And you might ask, why on earth would anybody do that, right? Well, the reason is that it can be very easy for you to work out how to parse a bit of C to experiment with some optimization that you've just come up with, right? And then spit out C to be passed through the, uh, another compiler to do all the rest of the work for you, okay? So you think there are things like Swift, which is a source-to-source -source compiler, and a bunch of other source-to-source -source compilers which do these kind of research-level uh, compilation things where they don't want to build a whole compiler, they just build a part of it and taking in C and spitting out C is quite a good way to do that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Things like LLVM will also do this for you. You can have LLVM take in your C code, do a bit, and then spit out C code for you that represents the same thing. That's kind of cool. Yeah? Oh. Okay, <laughs> let's see what's next. Okay. Uh, so let's just compare this to an interpreter. So the difference between an interpreter is that it takes in your source code and it uh, runs it dynamically uh, without compiling it uh, to produce the results as it goes. Okay? Easy? Mm -hmm. Easy. Good. Right. Well, just running the code, just translating the code down to source code um, isn't uh, enough, right? So you may know, Pavlos, that uh, when people first started coming up with... Uh, when, when, we were when, when scientists were first building computers, uh, everybody wrote in assembly code, basically, and uh, people were... Uh, trying to think that there were better ways to do this, and they were coming up with these high-level languages like Fortran and things like this. And the big worry for the Fortran guys was that it wasn't going to be fast enough to persuade people to move away from just handwriting assembly. So uh, they had to build optimizations in it because otherwise it wasn't going to be competitive. It turned out that they were able to do a better job of 
optimizing the code than humans are able to do by writing hand-built assemblies. Ah, at, least, at least compared to most humans. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Okay. okay. Not, not in your case, obviously, but uh, in, in other people's case. Mm. So, we have to be able to optimize the code as well. We have to be able to make it run faster uh, or use uh, lower power, lower energy, or make it smaller code size so it'll fit on your tiny little watches or whatever it is that you've got. Uh, and these days, actually, power and energy are becoming the foremost concerns for people rather than just performance, right? And you know this because this is the kind of stuff that you do in your work uh, of doing so, right? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So, yeah. So, we're not no longer just going for performance. We're going for these other things as well. Inside compilers, we have some of the most difficult uh, problems known to man, right? We have a whole bunch of things that are undecidable. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. It's about Turing. There's some. There's some. Turing had something. Yes. Yes. So undecidable means essentially that you. Yeah, I watched the uh, the movie about Turing the other day, but uh, it didn't explain what undecidable problems are. Unfortunately. Did, did it not? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, what is an undecidable problem? It's basically one where you <laughs> where you can't you can't work out. There's no. We can prove that there's no way to be sure what the right answer is. So let me give you an example. Right? Have you heard of the halting problem? Um, should I reply yes or no <laughs> for the purpose well, of this tell, recording? Tell me what the halting uh, problem is. The halting problem is that we, uh, for the for a general general problem for the for a generic prob, uh, program, yeah, we cannot decide in advance whether the uh, commutation is going to terminate or not. That's right. We can't decide whether the program is going to for for arbitrary programs. We cannot, in general, tell whether they are going to terminate. Well, now you can see that if your optimization requires you to know whether a particular piece of code is actually going to get run or not, right? And you want to say, well, say if it goes down, if it, if it executes this bit of the code, I need to be able to do something different elsewhere uh, or make some trade-offs in other bits. Uh, if you can't tell that, then you can't. You might not be able to make some optimizations uh, in general. Okay. Uh, on top of that, whilst we have these undecidability issues. Even when we make a bunch of assumptions uh, to enable us to make some progress, we have a bunch of MP-complete problems. Uh, you know what MP-complete means? To be frank, I, I've heard it multiple times, but uh, I never fully understood it. It's something about non-polynomial something. Okay, so 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 this well, okay, so the 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 easy way to think of this is that this is um, these are problems which are intractable, which means that. We think that that the fastest you can optimally solve them is in exponential time. Okay, so if you're if you give it a program of size n, uh, it's going to take two to the n time to solve the problem. Okay, that's the easy way to think about it. So hopefully, you guys have done a complexity course and be able to uh, do better on working out what that means. I right. haven't. <laughs> Uh, so it's actually uh, uh, not non-polynomial. It's actually solvable in polynomial time by a non-deterministic Turing machine. Okay, but you know that's it. Unimportant. The important thing is they're difficult problems, uh, computationally expensive. Okay. Well, these days as well, we have a problem which is that the um, the gap between the performance that you could get out of the machine if you give it uh, according to its specifications, as it were. And what you can actually get out of the machine is quite different. Okay, so why is that? Well, let me give you an example. All right, so um, so let's say we've got a, a GPU, and you see your GPU's uh, performance rated as some teraflops or whatever. How, what are they rated? Any teraflops these days? Probably gigaflops. Uh, a few gigaflops, mm -hmm. right? Okay, and it says you can get ten gigaflops out of your uh, uh, out of your 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 GPU, which means that it's going to be able to do ten billion. Uh, floating point operations per second, and then you write a program against it, and you run it on your GPU, and you find it gets nothing like that, not even close. And the reason is, is that these performance things that it talks about are under absolutely ideal conditions, okay? And it turns out that most programs aren't ideal, and so you can't get that kind of performance out of it. And the reasons are things like you can't move memory around fast enough, uh, it can't be optimized fully in order to uh, the, the the optimizations don't don't fully make use of all the functional units etc cetera, etc cetera. and so you don't get the same performance that you'd like to be able to get out of it. You know because you used to study caches and things like that that uh, the memory hierarchy causes enormous problems. You can't get enough data into the processor to keep it busy all the time, 
uh, and so you have these stalls and things, and your performance uh, gaps widen. Okay, so your processor can probably do more than it's actually doing, and it's probably spending some of its time sitting around being a little bit bored because it can't give you the full uh, amount of performance that it's got. Okay, and this problem is getting worse as well over time. All right, uh, and we have lots of different things that make writing a compiler very hard. Uh, there are lots of different things to think about. Uh, there are lots of different parameters of your architecture that uh, turn out to be very difficult for a human to keep in their head all at one time. Uh, there are all sorts of different instruction parallelisms, thread parallelism, multi-core parallelisms. Uh, there are accelerators now, so you've got DSPs, GPUs, and all sorts of things like this. And is it better to run it on the GPU or on the CPU? Uh, even if you just stuck on a single core CPU, these things are so fiendishly complicated these days, it's actually quite hard for a human to work out, given a piece of code, what the best way to optimize it is to make the, the best behavior uh, come out at the end. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so, managing the memory hierarchy, the different registers, different caches, and memory and disk and stuff like this, also causes problems because you don't always know what's going on with other parts of the system to be able to work out how you're going to be optimizing these things. And worse than that, of course, uh, you get lots of different machines, which all may be of the same family, but have slightly different cache sizes and things like this, and you don't know when you're writing your compiler which one you're going to be compiling for, so you end up having to make generalizations for these things, and you end up not making the best uh, out of these things in the long run. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Pablo, so I've got, uh, got a little question for you to, uh, to to give you an idea of how hard this kind of thing is. Okay, so imagine you have spent six months uh, writing a program, right, which uh, doesn't surprise me. How long did it take you to write Hello World the other day? It was about, uh, it was about three weeks, right? <laughs> okay, so six months to write a, to write a program, uh, and you have optimized it for the machine that you're running it on. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's got super, super, super fast, as fast as you can possibly get it by hand. And then some idiot comes along and says, well, I'll tell you what, unfortunately, we're going to have to now target the new processor that Intel has come out with. And the only difference between the old processor and the new one is that the cache replacement policy has been uh, changed from LRU to uh, random. Oh, no, other way around, from random cache replacement to LRU, least recently used cache replacement policy, right? How do you change your program in order to make best use of that? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, now, yeah, that's all this is, I'm now I'm asking the wrong person because this I'm, is a guy I'm, who I'm, I'm, I'm not sure this is the right question because it's not that hard to reason about. My <laughs> my my old partners actually produce a very nice uh, theoretical work called the Starcast, <laughs> which models uh, how random and LRU replacement interacts with the program. Okay, I hate you, Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> so the quick answer is that you. Uh, so uh, the thing with cache replacement <laughs> yes. it depends on the locality of your program, on whether it reuses recently used data. Right. right. So uh, random cache replacement is usually worse. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But could you, wait, wait. Could you answer? Could you answer the question? I don't know, Hugh. That would be very difficult to to be able to <laughs> to be able to optimize that program in that way. So to keep it short, you just <laughs> need to make uh, sure that you ha can extract as much locality as you can. If you have a large while with random. You can be forgiven if you don't do it that well. Okay, fine. Thank you, Pavlos, for um, <laughs> for really being but, helpful there. But, but uh, after all this uh, answer, uh, I have no idea. Here. Please, <laughs> please, please, please tell me. Okay, excellent. Well, what my point is is that it would be very hard to work out how to how to optimize your program, and even with what you just said, you'd still have some struggle to actually work out exactly where yeah, uh, in your code. To optimize your And program. still, you would probably need to have a PhD on uh, cash replacement to understand hmm. exactly. Is that what you've got? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. So, definitely asking the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so either you have a PhD in cash replacement or uh, or you're going to find this question difficult. Fine. Thank you, Pavlos. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so that's why we need uh, optimization. Okay. Uh, what does a compiler look like? Um, this is your sort of general structure of a modern compiler today. Uh, it takes in some source code on one end. It passes it through what is called the front end. The front end, uh, its job is to parse this string of characters and to work out what the structure of the program is that you've written. Uh, this bit's a for loop. Uh, that bit's an if, uh, so on and so forth, and compile it down into something called an abstract syntax tree, which you should all have should all know about from your compiling techniques course uh, from last year or from whatever you wherever you have done it before. Okay, so it spits out something called uh, an intermediate representation, which you'll often see abbreviated as IR, which is a sort of 
uh, a set of data structures which represent the program to the compiler in a way that it can work with. Okay, we then have the optimizer, which is sometimes called rather infuriatingly the middle end. Why would anybody call it the middle end? That just doesn't make any sense, right? You like it, though, don't you? Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. No. Okay. All right. So the middle end, or the optimizer, or the machine independent optimizer, which is a set of optimizations which work uh, on the IR, uh, changing it in ways that are going to be better. Uh, that generally speaking are better across all machines rather than just an individual machine. Okay. Uh, and then we have a back end which takes the result of the optimizer and does machine specific optimizations. Uh, doing things that can finally spit out the, uh, the 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 final binary or the assembly code that you want. Okay, mm -hmm. great, easy peasy. Why do we have all these layers? In why ah? Why why don't you we just have a huge uh, monolithic program that nobody can ever work uh, out what's going I, I, on inside? I'm pretty sure no one has ever thought about it before. And <laughs> it must have worked perfectly if someone did it. Well, so compilers are really huge pieces of software, right? I mean, uh, GCC is vast. I don't know, it's a million lines of code or something. I'm guessing, actually, I don't know. Um, and uh, and they are fiendishly complicated things. So this is a way of structuring the big piece of software into a way that you can actually think about it. And we'll, we'll, actually, I'll show you in a second. We'll have some smaller pieces of this, uh, because even this is not enough. Even these pieces are too big for people to typically reason about in a in a way that's maintainable going forward. So we actually normally we break up these those bits into uh, smaller pieces. So the front end has uh, three pieces in it uh, normally three big pieces. Uh, the scanner, the parser, and we'll come to these in a second. The scanner, the parser, and an elaboration phase. Uh, and we break these up because it, it allows us to go through different steps that we can understand in a more simple way. The optimizer normally has a set of passes or phases, depending on which terminology you use. Uh, essentially, they are optimizations that run one after the other. Often, they can be the order can be changed, although try that in most compilers and it will fall over pretty quickly. Uh, and the back end does some specific things, which we'll also come to later, that um, allow us to take this code and... Now that we know what machine we're running on, we know how many registers we need, so we can allocate registers. Uh, we can select machine instructions for the high-level concepts that we have from the upper levels. And we can schedule the instructions uh, to make the ordering good to, to get the best performance out of the thing. And we often have different intermediate representations for these uh, that are appropriate to the things that are being worked on. So we have a high-level AST uh, for the abstract syntax tree for the front end, uh, a higher-level um, optimization intermediate representation, a low-level intermediate representation at the back end, which understands the specific machine instructions. So in GCC, we have... Now, if I get this right... Uh, okay, the front end is... I can't remember what the front end uses. The middle end uses uh, Gimple and the back end uses uh, a register-to-register -register allocation uh, scheme, three address scheme, something like that. I have no idea. Yes, I <laughs> okay, I can't remember. Uh, but who, yes. who, know, who knows what's happening inside GCC? Uh, nobody knows what's happening. Nobody has ever worked out what's going on inside GCC. I, I mean, there are, presentation talk, there are presentations and talks about it, but uh, I don't even believe that those people know what's happening inside GCC. I, I have worked in GCC before. It is uh, as I did that a lot of that for my PhD, and it is, uh, uh, it's grown organically one over one years. One version, 1.2. <laughs> <Ouch. laughs> oh, Thank you, Pavlos. Thank you. Uh, no, uh, slightly later than that. Uh, maybe not that much later than that. Right, fine, okay. 24. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Liz, I'm not that old. <laughs> Actually, I probably am, but never mind. Um, okay, so there we go. So we've got those uh, those different bits. Do those all make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. All right, so uh, let's have a look at what's going on in the front end, because I guess that's what we're going to cover a little bit of today, because... We aren't going to talk about it anymore for the rest of the course, right? We're going to assume that you know all this, and this is just a review of the stuff that you should already know. So we had those three bits. We had the scanner, the parser, and we had an elaboration phase, which we'll come to in a little bit, which isn't on here. Okay, so the lexical analysis uh, is done by the scanner. It goes through the uh, characters in your program text, and it works out uh, what each of the blocks of characters are. So it says this, this little string here is a, is a number, uh, this string here is an identifier. This string here is a curly brace that opens a thing. That kind of stuff, right? So those those lexemes or tokens 
are uh, what it spits out a stream of these tokens that have then passed down to the next layer. Uh, and the way this is done is by using a finite state automata. You know, in FSA, you know these sort of graphs of showing how you move from one state to another, uh, and uh, with the edges representing um, the characters that you need to see to move to those states. We have a, a parser which takes this stream of tokens and builds an abstract syntax tree from this, typically based on a context-free grammar, although it turns out that actually you need some other stuff uh, generally to be able to work out how to disambiguate parts of this thing, which we'll come to again, uh, but it spits out the abstract syntax tree. Uh, that's the syntactic analysis. Semantic analysis goes through the abstract syntax tree and checks that it actually makes sense. For example, um, you may have uh, used a variable before it is defined, which the abstract syntax tree doesn't distinguish from because it just notices that you've got a statement using the, the, the thing. Uh, the semantic analysis will go and do all these checks and make sure that all the types are right. Uh, you can't, maybe in your language, you can't add a number to a string. Uh, maybe you can some languages, but you you know it checks that those type things are done correctly and it annotates the graph with the the, the abstract syntax tree with those things. Okay, uh, and what you'll find is that lots of real compilers do this by hook or by crook, by some handwritten piece of code that nobody know nobody any longer wants to touch because they don't know whether um, touching it is going to break it. Uh, but there are more modern ways of doing these things with attribute grammars. Uh, Milner type inference and things like this that enable you to systematize this stuff and do it in a in a sensible way. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do a bit of that in a second. All right, okay. Uh, and the semantic analysis phase builds a symbol table which tells you what each name in the program represents. So it'll say this name is a function, this name is a variable, uh, so on and so forth. Okay? 